Hello, welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. Program number 15 in our series, The Parables of Jesus. Now we have, we're getting to one of the most well-known of all of the parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Let me explain something here about what that means. Samaria was just in between Galilee, that's where Jesus was born, and Judea, where Jerusalem was. You had Jerusalem, then the next, just north of the Judea, the area of Judea, was Samaria. Above that was Galilee. Now, Samaria had, was very different. Uh, they had their own temple. Uh, they, only, um, they only accepted uh, the first books, the five books of Moses. They had a, a, it was a completely different thing. It was a mixed race. Uh, the Assyrians in the 8th century B.C. brought in other people into the land and they, and they um, mingled with and uh, co-mingled with uh, many of the Jewish people who were there, who were remained. And so you, it was a mixed race and the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. I mean, it was racial, it was political, it was religious, it was all of that, and it was not good. In fact, very few Jews would even go from, um, let's say, Galilee to Judea and go through Samaria. They mostly would go um, the other side of the Jordan River, east, they'd travel east, then south, and then west, and they come up to Jerusalem by way of the Jericho Road, 17 miles from Jericho uh, to Jerusalem. And so, so that's Samaria. And they were hated people by the Jews. They, they just hated each other. Um, and so you have to understand that that's going on when, when we hear the word, the good Samaritan. Okay. If you don't get that, you're going to be in trouble <laughs> understanding this parable. All right. We are in now Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, we're beginning at verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, now, a lawyer, who is this? This would be what we would call a scribe. Uh, these were the highly educated little group um, that you, in that, that day. They were the lawyers uh, they wrote out the wills. They did the business transactions. Uh, they, were, they were truly the law lawyers. Uh, most of them were of the party of the Pharisees, of the party of the Pharisees. It was sort of like the lawyers were the upper echelon of the Pharisees. I came across some material that made me wonder if all lawyers were Pharisees, and I came across a couple some information that caused me to suspect maybe such was not the case. I've always thought the opposite, but uh, I, at this point I'm unsure. But anyway, so a, a lawyer stood up, that is to Jesus, to put him to the test. Now, uh, what was he going to do? Put Jesus to the test um, to see if he, he was able to answer correctly uh, or was he going to uh, subvert the current uh, status uh, and give something completely different, or, or maybe he was just incapable, maybe he just didn't know much. I mean, it, it would have been plain that Jesus had not been educated in either the school of Hillel or Shammai, that was obvious. He was not uh, any graduate or disciple of anybody. And so this was a test, but we have to guess as what the nature of the test was. Um, and so here's what he says. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the word inherit is a bit of a strange word because it's, it's what you would receive, let's say, when a father would die. And there would be an inheritance. And in Leviticus, there were rather complex laws about how that was all done. Um, 
but he says eternal life. We don't know if he's asking a serious question. You'd, you'd hope to be able to look at an expression, sound of the voice, the posture, to determine if he was sincere, was this a heartfelt thing, that he wanted eternal life. E eternal life was not exactly what was on the tips of tongues of Jewish people. That, you, didn't, you didn't find much of that. It was more centered in this, in this earth here and getting along now. Um, so it's a very peculiar question on the part of a lawyer of all, peace, of all people to inherit eternal life. So, uh, and by the way, not everybody thinks that the Good Samaritan is a parable. Uh, there are those who think that Jesus is simply telling a story but brings an application out of a real life event. Uh, I have to say I have not made up my mind at this point. If it's an actual parable, parable, or Jesus is just talking about a story that everybody knew about. If I had to vote, uh, I would say it's not a parable, but he is regurgitating a story that would have been on the minds of people at that particular time. Anyway, it's beside the point, isn't it? Anyway, verse 26, he said to him, uh, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, here's, here's, here's Jesus. Here's little meek and mild, uneducated Jesus talking to the lawyer and asking him a legal question. Uh, Jesus is very clever. He just turns the whole thing in his head. Instead of answering, he asks a question. And the guy goes with it. Verse 27, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That's out of Leviticus chapter 19. Uh, these are the two great commandments which Jesus endorsed. Uh, we're to love God with all of us. All of us. And then it says, and your neighbor... As yourself, how do you love your neighbor? That's the key. The key is, is not who is my neighbor, but how do you take care of, how do you love your neighbor? See, this is what Jesus is going to get to. Uh, <clears throat> the Pharisees considered anybody not in their club, in their group, as somebody that was not your neighbor. Uh, then there were uh, the Qumran community, the Qumran community, who uh, considered that if you weren't in their group, that's the Dead Sea Scroll people, if you weren't in their group, you could be hated. You were to hate them, not just ignore them, but you were to hate them. Uh, the Israelites in general, the Jewish people, um, considered only Israelites to be their neighbor. Certainly not the Samaritans, okay? Certainly not those guys. So that's not so hard to, to realize. That's pretty much what we do today, isn't it? You know, it's always so easy to look back and say, yeah, that's what it was with those people, but we do the same thing today. Maybe even worse. Uh, we're, we're in... Uh, we're in a very strange era in our world. I don't want to go on to that too much. But we really narrow it down about who is our neighbor, who is acceptable, who is it that we ought to care for. Um, and it sometimes comes in the form of a free speech movement, hate speech movement, Me Too movement, uh, on and on and on, making all of the barriers and, and a lot of times it gets really small. You, you got to be like this. If you're not like this, if you use that product and you got this and you, you know, some people, you don't have an electric car, man. You're poisoning the planet. He goes on and on. It's not that you know, those things aren't really happening. I'm not, I'm not political. I don't like to get involved in politics at all. I don't care about that stuff. Meaningless to me. But we use it to create a little group. People that are acceptable to us, who do and say the right things. 
according to what we think is proper. That's what they were doing here in spades, but we do it in spades too. Just read the newspaper, watch television, and it's everywhere, left, right. We're, we're busy doing it, big time. Anyway, a lot of people hit the remote, I know, that's all right. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus said, do this and you'll live. <laughs> well, of course, he's not going to do that. How interesting Jesus is. He's not going to love anybody but his group. As yourself. Notice we have a little idea of how we are to love other people as ourselves. We know how we want to be treated. Well, that is the measure that we are to help our neighbor. We're going to find out who our neighbor is in a little bit. Verse 29, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Hmm. We are always busy justifying ourselves. Why we are right and why the other person is wrong. But you know, it's kind of surfacy a lot of times because down deep, if you've had the opportunity to learn humility, you don't have that stance. I was at the prison last night, San Quentin Prison. I don't often talk about this, but I've been out at San Quentin Prison for 34 years. I've been doing the baseball program for 16 years. I got outed five years ago. I'm back now. And uh, I was talking to a guy who was in prison for 10 years for domestic um, dispute, domestic problem. He even got accused of attempted murder of his wife. And he was going home Sunday, this Sunday. This is Thursday. In two, three days, he'll be gone. And uh, he was umpiring. And I was out at first base coaching, and I got to have a long talk with him all game long. And I asked him, what did you learn in here in the 10 years you've been in prison for something that, and it was not a gang guy. He hadn't grown up in that. He'd just gotten a mess, bad situation. He knew he was wrong. And he said, I, first thing he's out of his mouth, he said, I've learned humility. I've learned humility. And that is one of the great things to learn is, our humi is humility. So he says, who is my neighbor? He's trying to justify himself. Um, he wants, he, it's so important for him to see himself as being okay. I'm good. I'm a good person. So he says, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it says down. Now, Jerusalem is 2,300 feet elevation. Um, that's the number that I use. Jericho, on the other hand, is 900 feet below sea level. So you've got a difference of 3,200 feet in elevation on its 17-mile trip, and it is rugged going, rugged going for at least half of it. And there were robbers. In fact, I read about there was a robber by the name of Abu Jildah, who was finally captured in 1934, was robbing people on the Jericho Road. Huh. So not much has changed. So at any rate, going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, <clears throat> they stripped him. One of the most important items you had was clothes. Oftentimes, you had one piece of clothes. I remember growing up as a kid, my, my parents were not wealthy. My dad was a fuller brush man. He was for 50 years, three, three kids. And we lived in a, a lower, middle, uh, little, lower middle class house, pretty close to downtown Portland, Oregon. I had one pair of shoes. I had about two pair of jeans, I had a couple shirts, I had a jacket, and I had a hat, I had some t-shirts, and some underwear. That was it. 
you could put all my clothes in one little drawer, one chest of drawers. And that's how it was, a chest of drawers for my and my brothers. The three drawer, we each had one drawer. Uh, there was nothing hung up in the closet, maybe a jacket. In that day, uh, you had some clothes. Well, Robert's going to take that. That's a valuable piece. Here's the man. He's naked. He's completely naked. He's bloody, nearly dead, and he's been robbed. Whatever he had, gone. He has zero now. He may have been on an animal, probably. Now he's got nothing. And there he is. Verse 31, now by chance. Now, I love the little phrase, by chance. I'd like to have asked Jesus, what do you mean by, by chance? What, was that? What's, what is the meaning of that? I, I didn't get any help with the commentators. He said, anyway, by chance a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, a priest would have belonged to the family of Aaron. Now, Aaron was a brother of Moses. And we're talking 15, 1,600 years before this. Moses, the one who led the Exodus, the people of Israel out of Egypt, received the Ten Commandments. Moses had a sister named Miriam and a brother named Aaron. And Aaron became the head of the priesthood. A priest is someone who stands between God and man, who stands between, is an intermediary. That's the idea of priest. There's no such thing as a priest in the New Testament. Jesus appointed no priest, none. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. There were different offices. There was the prophet, the Uh, the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, but there were no priests. Because every person, because of Christ, what he did in our life, we go directly to God. We don't go through a church, through a man. We go direct. We have a direct relationship with, with God himself. We have a direct relationship. I can pray, our Father who is in heaven. I don't go through anybody. It's always been that way with Christianity until the concept of the intermediary intermediary, but Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Anyway, so Aaron and all of his family, they did a lot of the work in the temple. Okay, that, that's the, the priesthood. Verse 32, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. Now a Levite uh, was a member of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, tribe of Levi, they were called Levites, They served in the temple. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was a Levite. And they would spend a two-week period twice. In other words, they spent a month in Jerusalem serving at the temple. And many of them lived in Jericho. Because it was, a, it was, a, it was you know, a few-hour donkey ride um, to, uh, from Jerusalem, uh, to Jericho to Jerusalem and back. So... So a Levite passed by. Now verse 33, but, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. Now this man is, has to be Jewish, has to be Jewish. Um, Samaritans, this wasn't their area. They didn't live there. They lived up north. That was dangerous for a Samaritan to be down there. And we don't, have, we don't have the answer of, what's, what's this guy doing down here? What's this about? But there he is. And like I say, I, I go for it being an actual story. As I'm presenting this to you right now, my mind is pretty well made up. There's not a parable. It's going to go down forever as a parable. But I think Jesus is telling a story about what actually had happened that everybody was a buzz about. So he came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He had compassion. We looked at the guy and said, that could be me. 
And maybe that's one of the reasons why the Samaritan had the compassion. <coughs> maybe it had happened to him. Uh, maybe he had been accosted on that road. All kind of robbers. It was a bad place. And we don't know why he had the compassion. Jesus doesn't tell us. But he had compassion. This Samaritan, not the priest, not the Levite, but the, the Samaritan, the hated Samaritan. See, it wouldn't have been a big story if the, if the, the guy who had been beaten up had been a Samaritan. Well, it was just another guy helping another guy. But this guy has to be Jewish. Verse 34. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, the wine would have acted as... Um, an antiseptic, is that the right word? Um, it would have uh, helped to get rid of any germs. Who knows how long the guy had been, been laying there in the dirt, very likely the dirt, laying there. Uh, and he pours on the wine to cleanse the wound, put some oil on, perhaps as a salve, um, maybe control, maybe uh, blood loss. We don't know. So... This means, by the way, oil and wine are expensive materials, very expensive materials. Then it says, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He took him to an inn someplace. You know, there's somebody, some of these tourist trap places have got to have the inn where the Samaritan came. I bet you, I haven't been there, but. Um, in that particular area of Israel, but I'll just have an idea. Uh, so he took him, uh, took care of him. So he stayed there. He took care of him. Uh, this guy was more important than his own business and what he was doing. Obviously, he had some with, he had some means. Uh, he has the oil, the wine. He has a donkey. He's going to give the innkeeper two denarii. That's two days' wages. Uh, he's got some means. So he took care of him. There's 30, 35. And the next day, he took out two denarii. So he stayed with them overnight, completely disrupts his, his, whole, his whole trip, takes out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Uh, he gives them carte blanche. It could have been really expensive. This guy doesn't care what it's going to cost. He's going to take care of this man. He has compassion on him. Now, <clears throat> this is a little bit, this is a little bit um, reminding me right now of the ministry of Jesus and the crucifixion. The, the stripped body of Jesus, beaten bloody, finally crucified all to take care of us because he had compassion upon us. Here in the crucifixion story, the one who has been stripped and beaten bloody and left to die is the one who has compassion upon us. I've never heard it preached that way. It just came to me. I don't know, right or wrong, but anyway... Uh, that's what I got. <clears throat> so he's going to repay him when he comes back. So he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? <clears throat> who was it? Who was the man who fell among the robbers? Who, um, who was the neighbor? So the neighbor is the person who needs the help. Wherever he is, whoever he or she is, in whatever condition, for whatever reason, for whatever reason. Um, I brought up San Quentin. I almost never bring this up. But um, I've, learned, I've learned some compassion in my years there. Because especially doing the baseball, you get to know a lot of guys, and you know them all of a long time. Uh, since I've been gone for five years, doing being kicked out, which I can't tell you the story. I did nothing wrong. 
Uh, several of us got kicked out uh, for the same event. Uh, very interesting. But um, in the baseball program, I get to know people for a long period of time. And uh, just last night while I was there, some guys that had played on my team years ago, I'm sitting in the dugout, first base dugout, and a guy that I had not seen for a long time comes sits by me and puts his arm around me and says, hey, coach, glad to see you. And I say, who are you? What? I can't remember you. Because I, you know, I didn't recognize him because he changed a lot. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and I just saw the compassion. I would just see and experience the compassion that a lot of people who bring ministry out to, uh, the, to the prisoners. And it's real compassion. It's not just do-goodism or you want to be able to say, hey, I go out to San Quentin. That, that wears thin after a while. Um, but it is such a profound experience. And um, that's the, your, your neighbor is the one who fell among the robbers. That's who your neighbor is. Okay, I better hurry up. He said, the one, he says, well, who is it? He says, the one who showed him mercy. Mercy. The mercy. Now, isn't this what happens to us? We have been, we have received mercy. The one whom we have offended, the one whom we have sinned against, has given us mercy. I know this is turning a little bit different um, on, on, on this on this pharaoh, but it, it's it's plain here. Uh, the one who showed him mercy. Our Lord shows us mercy. We who turned our back on him, who broke all of his commandments, some more than others. I'm one who has broken more than most. I think it's one of the reasons why I identify uh, with convicts. <clears throat> I think it's one of the reasons. Because I was one of those longtime jerks. <clears throat> I received mercy. And when you receive mercy, you're more likely to give mercy. Because you know what it's like to be stripped and robbed and beaten. You know what that's like. And to receive that mercy want, causes you to want to extend mercy to others. So he says, the one who showed him mercy, and Jesus said to him, you go, you go, and do likewise. Ha, ah, that's what Jesus says to the lawyer, the big PhD, you go and do likewise. He would have been charged right to his soul. So long.